with a sparkling eye. Yes, she is a maiden with a love. Its sound quality is poor, but its effect was great. It's a reminder of some of the first, best times for Boston's American League team and its unequaled fans. Tessie is a song from the turn of the century, and it's been tied to the Red Sox since before they were the Red Sox. They were the Boston Americans when the tune helped them win the first World Series ever back in 1903. Now, Tessie has a more modern relative. So who is this Tessie? What are these songs about? What do Johnny Damon, Bronson Arroyo, and Lenny DiNardo have to do with her? And most important, with their help, can she reverse the curse? It's all next on Red Sox Stories. The Boston Americans' most loyal fans were called the Royal Rooters. They were often accompanied to games by a band, as shown in the foreground here. My impression of the Royal Rooters is that they were fairly well-off business people, a couple hundred of them from the Boston business community. Maybe the equivalent of some of the clubs like a Rotary today or something like that. The Rooters' headquarters once stood here on the corner of Tremont and Ruggles, now part of Northeastern University. The tavern was named the Third Base Saloon, so named because you had to stop at third base before going home. Its owner was the Royal Rooters leader, Michael Nuff said McGreevy. Remember, we didn't have radio, we didn't have television, and the saloons played a very important role in the social life of all these people. They would have all sorts of activities to keep people coming to their saloon. The most successful man uh, was Michael McGreevy uh, with his third base on the avenue, the last stop before you go home, uh, and his was notoriously the best baseball saloon. And of course, we know how he got his nickname of Nuff Said because arguments would constantly break out in the saloon, and when Michael had had enough of it, he would leap upon the bar and scream, Nuff Said! And wherever McGreevy and the Royal Rooters went, they made their presence known. And they would come to the games uh, uh, in uh, in formation, marching down Huntington Avenue, uh, wearing their Sunday best outfits and their bowler hats uh, with their ticket stubs in the band of the bowler hats. Uh, and the gates would open up for them and they would go marching into the, uh, uh, the stadium uh, in a serpentine fashion to the seats that were awaiting them. The fans would cheer everything that their players would do and really felt a part of uh, the action, uh, singing and dancing in the aisles. The Royal Rooters and Americans fans in general were not so different than Red Sox fans of today. Sitting and standing wherever there was space in the packed ballpark, they were dedicated, boisterous, and they took wins and losses personally. By 1903, the wins were coming in bunches. Thanks to rating the National League's best players by paying them more, some like Americans pitcher Cy Young and player manager Jimmy Collins were earning as much as $6,000 per season. But after two seasons of escalating salaries, the leagues came to an agreement. They agreed that they would not raid each other's teams and that they would try to live in harmony. In 1903, with fans filling the Huntington Avenue grounds regularly, the Americans won their first league title with a record of 91 and 47. The Pittsburgh Pirates won the National League with a nearly identical record of 91 and 49. At the time, however, league champs didn't play each other. But the newfound interleague harmony led to a most historic agreement. This is what allowed Barney Dreyfus, the owner of the Pittsburgh franchise of the older circuit, to go to Henry Killalay, the owner of the Boston Americans, of the new league and suggest, after it looked like the two of them would win their respective titles, 
to say, hey, here's a nice way that we can both make a lot of money in the postseason. We've stirred up a lot of enthusiasms. And after a lot of very harsh negotiations, we had an agreement to have a postseason tournament. The postseason tournament, the first one between the American and National Leagues, was called the World Series. The letter uh, issuing the challenge talks about the World Series. Uh, the owner of the Boston Club, uh, a, uh, a Milwaukee lawyer, was a little unsure as to whether they should play the World Series, uh, and so he brought the proposal to Ban Johnson, who was the president of the American League. Ban Johnson asked Jimmy Collins, can we beat those guys? And Collins said, yes, sir, we can. And so the World Series was on for October 1903. It was a best of nine series with the first three games and the final two games scheduled for Boston. The middle four games would be in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh had won its third pennant in a row. And so, as they were called, the champions of the West, most people thought that they would win the series. As it started out, it seemed like they were right. The Pirates took game one in Boston with Cy Young giving up four runs in the first but the Americans tied the series on the strength of a Bill Deneen shutout in Game 2. On Saturday, October 3rd, overflow attendance, guessed to be between 25 and 30,000, forced police to hold fans behind ropes on the outfield grass in fair territory. The Pirates won by hitting ground rule doubles into those fans. The Americans trailed two games to one. The team and 125 Royal Rooters headed by train to Pittsburgh. The teams headed west. On a Sunday, no Sunday baseball played in 1903, uh, and they arrived in Pittsburgh uh, on the banks of the Ohio, Monongahela, and Allegheny uh, at the end of that rainy Sunday. Uh, Monday rained as well. Enough said McGreevy, that most wonderful, wonderful fan, thinks that he needs a little bit something else to get his Royal Rooters and his Boston Americans going. So they comb the city and they find the sheet music for a popular Broadway musical called The Silver Slipper. And its theme song, Tessie. Tessie is a maiden with a love. Tessie doesn't know the meaning of a sigh. Tessie's lots of fun and full of charm, but sometimes when we have a little quarry too, Tessie always turns her head away, and then it's up to me to do as all boys do. So I take her hand in mine and say, Don't blame me if I ever doubt you. You know I wouldn't live without you. Tessie, you are the only, only, only. In game four, the Sox fall behind five to one and it's the ninth inning. And they decide to start singing Tessie. And lo and behold, the Red Sox come alive, scores 5-4, but they fall short. But everyone is quite enthused. That night, the Royal Rooters stayed up late, writing their own verses. The lyrics that they finally came up with uh, made fun of the great star of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Hannes Wagner. Hannes, why do you bat so badly? Uh, making fun of his swing. That day, under Cy Young, they won 11 to 2. The next day, under Bill Deneen, they won 6 to 3 as Tessie was sung over and over and over. The next day, it was Cy Young again, 7 to 3. And now back to Boston where everyone was thinking of Tessie. Once again, the weather was bad. They had the days on. The Pittsburgh team thought they were taking a show at the Colonial Theater. As they went in to sit down for their enjoyment, the band struck up and played Tessie. The next day was much of the same as Bill Deneen 
mowed them down to end the series three to nothing. Tessie was especially tough on Hall of Fame shortstop Hannes Wagner, who hit just 222 in the series, with more strikeouts, four, than runs batted in, three. On October 15, 1903, uh, with another stellar performance uh, by pitcher Bill Deneen, uh, and uh, enormous rooting and singing by the Royal Rooters. Boston was the first champion of the world. 30 years later, Hannes Wagner in an interview said, I hate that song, I still hate that song. Tommy Leach, the third baseman, stated right after the World Series that they had lost to Tessie, that how 200 fans could have driven them all that insane with their only 16,000 16, fans seems miraculous, but the incessant singing of it from the beginning to the game to the end drove them a little berserk. The song went on for years, actually, in the very first day of the 1904 season, April 18th of 1904, right at the Huntington Avenue grounds, they had the very first pennant raising ceremony where they raised a huge flag, Boston American League champions, and a group called Teal's Boston Band played Tessie to, uh, to kick off the ceremonies. So Tessie had helped them win the first World Series ever, but that wouldn't be the last we'd hear from her. Don't blame us if we ever doubt ya, you know we couldn't live without ya, Tessie! You Tessie's recent rebirth, with some socks singing along, next on Red Sox Stories. Red Sox Executive Vice President of Public Affairs, Dr. Charles Steinberg, first heard the original version of Tessie last fall. Well, that's right. We found the song on the internet. I think Jeff Goldenberg sent it over to me. But it was very scratchy. Now, that's part of its charm. But when you're playing a song at Fenway, even new, fresh recordings sound scratchy. So when you're playing a song that's 100 years old and sounds even more scratchy, it was really inaudible and I wanted to play it during postseason. I had visions of playing it in the 2003 World Series 100 years later. So the question was, couldn't somebody remake that old song and couldn't somebody make a modern version of it? Charles said, I wonder why no one's ever covered that. You know, he goes, I think that would be a, a hit if someone ever modernized the song and uh, you know, uh, put their own twist on it, and uh, it didn't take me long. I, I said, uh, you know, I, I said, I think I got the guys to do it. Those perfect guys are a popular band of local Red Sox fans named the Dropkick Murphys. You, he thought we'd be perfect to remake it because a lot of what we do, part of the band's um, identity is that we take, you know, uh, old traditional Irish songs that, you know, most, most uh, people that listen to them are over 70, you know, and kind of give it the spin for a new generation, you know, um, give it a kick in the pants, so to speak. You know. So they hit the recording studio to add that kick. We were taking like the two main forms of music that we had in our lives as a kid, which was like traditional Irish music, which we kind of had ingrained in us from our upbringing, and then punk rock, which is what we, you know, were kind of involved in as teenagers. So who are these dropkick Murphys? Basically a bunch of regular guys who uh, happen to <laughs> be able to write some catchy tunes. A punk rock band? A bunch of regular guys? Maybe not. Crazy, crazy fools. Uh, uh, I can't really, you know, there's, there's, there's so many characters, you know. This band is big on shenanigans. We're a big shenanigan band. We, we like to make sure that everybody is, is laughing, usually at someone else's expense, but as long as someone's laughing, that's, you know, that's a good thing. But what are these song-making Sox fans supposed to do with an old scratchy recording from 1903? There was plenty of doubt. So I emailed this MP3 to, to Ken in Europe, and they listened to it. And basically, he said they gathered around his computer and they laughed their butts off because it was, you know, how could they do this? And the words were awful, and I was, well, how are we going to do this song? It doesn't fit with the band at all. It was 
unbelievable. It was about a woman and her parrot, a girl and her parrot, and she tells her secrets to the parrot, and the parrot blurts out the secrets at night. And Tessie has a parrot that she loves quite well. Polly's just a learning how to woo. Tessie tells him everything she has to tell. Polly thinks he knows a thing or two. Tessie gave her party at her home one night. And Polly said he'd like to sing a song. And Tessie thought she'd never seen a bird so bright. When Polly started off an accent strong. It's, it's a song about a bird and this lady. And I'm like, a, a bird? You, you want to do a bird song? A song about a bird? What are you talking about, dude? I was like, oh, my, you're kidding me. You know, it was pretty, pretty, uh... Dreadful. I came in and I was like, what is this? And like we, part of what we do is updating like folk songs and stuff. And we, had, and we sat down with that and we were like, where are we even going to go with this? Now I hear is, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I can't hear what's going on, dude. So Ken's like, just, just you, you know what to do. You know, just do the, give me a, you know, that's, that's Ken's character. So he gets back to me and said, you know what, this is a little, um, I guess the word I'll use is uh, strange. And uh, he goes, we can't really, we can't do this. He goes, well, let's do this. He goes, if you want to write a new version of Tessie, you know, using that as, as the basis, we'll do it. And so that's how it came about. So I ended up in spring training, uh, just taking some time and rewriting the lyrics and Instead of uh, making it about a girl and a parrot, I made it about the story of the Royal Rooters and uh, you know the fans of the Red Sox, the original fans of the Red Sox. The brilliance of Jeff's poetry to me, his lyrics, is that he took the actual lyrics from the old song and gave them new meaning in the new song. So in the old song, here's this guy saying to his girl, don't blame me if I ever doubt you, you know I couldn't live without you. And it has new meaning now because you can picture Red Sox fans singing this to their players, saying, don't blame us if we ever doubt you. Doubt you is a euphemism for boo you. You know we couldn't live without you. So the actual lyrics from 100 years ago are reborn. So he's given new life to old lyrics, and he's given new life to an old story. So you take lyrics like, Tessie, you're my only, only, only. And in the rock song, Tessie, you're my only, only, only. Then in the last refrain, Boston, you're my only, only, only. Red Sox, you're my only, only, only. What he did was brilliant. Tessie, you are the only, only, only. So the new Tessie was born, 101 years after the old Tessie had sparked Boston's first world championship. And we decided to put the piano in it just to have it retain some kind of uh, identity to the original song. And I think the new version, you know, has a modern day rock and roll feel, but the piano gives it that, that little bit of an old timey kind of feel. And to give it a baseball feel, some socks were invited to add players and more layers to the vocals. Johnny Damon recorded. Don't blame us if we ever doubt you. You know we couldn't live without you. Tessie, you are the only, only, only. You had a little harmony there, hear that? <laughs> and later that night, pitchers Lenny DiNardo and Bronson Arroyo pitched in. Boston, you are the only, only. The antique tune had been successfully dusted off, rewritten, and re-recorded. When I heard that first version that he did, I said, oh, wow, this is amazing. You know, it really is. It, it's, this you can, you can envision being played in stadiums and, and people singing along to it, and it was just, uh, it blew me away. Despite the update, the heart and soul of Tessie was still about the fans of Boston's American League baseball team. Tessie is the Royal Rooters rally cry. The Dropkick Murphys reveal the new Tessie when Red Sox Stories continues. The Dropkick Murphys version of Tessie debuted June 4th on Boston's WBCN radio. So, without further ado, the Boston radio debut of the Dropkick Murphys, Tessie, a 104.1 WBCN, Boston. Well, you've got to listen to it a few times, maybe a hundred to get the feel of the lyrics. But when you do, then something magic happens. When you, you follow the words and you really hear this great story. Tessie is the Royal Rooters rally cry. Tessie is the song they'd always sung. 
Tessie echoed April through October nights after serenading green ball players. Stahl, Deneen, and Young. Then he goes back to the old lyrics that were actually in the song. Tessie is a maiden with sparkling eyes. Tessie is a maiden with a laugh. It really grabs the people who love the blend of Red Sox history and tough Boston rock and roll. Uh, Tessie, Nuff said, McGreevy shouted, we're not here to mess around. Boston, you know we love you madly, hear the crowd roar to your sound. Uh, it's a song made for Boston and made about the Red Sox. Within weeks of the song's debut, a music video was underway. And here it is. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the Dropkick Murphys. Tessie is the royal root is rally cry. Tessie is the tune they always sung. Tessie echoed April through October nights after serenade and stalled the Nain and Young. Tessie is a maiden with a sparkling eyes. Tessie is a maiden with a love. She doesn't know the meaning of her side. She's got a comment full of love. The game is on the line Tessie always carried them away Up the road from third base to Huntington The boys would always sing and sway with the curse of the Bambino. If you want another championship in Boston, bring back Tessie. Don't play 